All right, so in this video, I'm just going to kind of polish off the last uh, theorem here in this uh, section. Uh, so we're going to show that if you take two continuous functions and then you compose them, uh, you end up with another continuous function. And so function composition is something that I'm not sure I really addressed at any point. Um, and it might be something worth talking a little bit about on its own because it is a bit of a different, I mean, it's, it's not difficult to understand as an operation, but, but it is definitely different from, you know, like adding two functions or multiplying two functions or whatever. It's kind of a fundamentally different type of operation. So uh, let me just like describe it for you a little bit. So suppose um, F and G are functions uh, where, uh, you know, well, yeah, our functions uh, then, oh, actually, probably want to do G compose F is the function. I'm kind of purposely leaving out discussions of, uh, you know, what the domain uh, the domains of F and G are and what the domain of G compose F is. Okay, I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But the function uh, G compose F is the function defined by um, G compose F of X is G of F of X. Okay, so, you know, in words, is uh is the function which applies f and then g okay so you take the input pass it through f and get an output then pass that through g and then you get your final output that's the function g compose f and remember as always this is the notation you want to use if you're talking about the entire function g compose f. Just this g and then a little circle. It's like an empty multiplication symbol almost. g circle f, okay. Uh, that is the symbol which represents the function which is the composition of these two functions, okay. This here, g of f of x, that is not a function. Again, it's just like a value. We've taken x and we plugged it into f. And then we took F and plugged it into G, okay? It's really, really good to avoid using this as the symbol for um, G compose F, all right? This is much, much better. Or just G compose F itself is the name of the function, right? This G circle F, that's the name of the function, which is the composition, okay? Uh, so now in the case, so if the domain of F and the domain of G <clears throat> are subsets of R, like in our case. Uh, and F and G are, you know, let's say real valued. Then the domain of G compose F is the set of X in the domain of F. Uh, such that f of x is in the domain of g. And this could also be written, um, which I'll just sort of say by definition, uh, you could, or not really by definition, but we haven't really defined this yet, but I think I might make a separate video explaining this concept. But there's a concept called an inverse image. Uh, so like the notation using inverse images, the notation for this set would just be, um, F inverse uh, domain of G. Okay, and uh, so this, okay, to be very, very clear, this is not the inverse of F, which probably doesn't exist, okay? Most functions don't have an inverse. I mean, that's just a fact, right? Uh, so f, f in this context probably does not have an inverse. This is not the inverse function of f. This is literally this entire thing taken together 
is just a symbol, which basically represents this set, okay? If you don't understand that, just ignore it for now. Um, like I said, I'll probably, I mean, we will eventually be using this notation. I'll probably make a separate video explaining it, but just, I mean, yeah. For those of you who are sort of familiar with it, maybe it'll be helpful to think of it this way. Uh, but anyway, so this just represents, you know, whenever you do F inverse and then put a set inside, it's just what you get out is like the set of all input values, which map into the set that's like inside the parentheses here. So that's exactly what this is, okay? All right, anyway, so um, let's just, uh, I'm gonna prove this theorem. Uh, I'm gonna, well, state and prove the theorem. So here we have, um, Theorem 17.5, and so if f and g are real valued functions with the domain of f and domain of g being subsets of r, um, then and uh, and let's say and x naught is a point or rather let's just say this f is continuous at x naught and g is continuous at f of x naught Okay, so we're gonna assume that x naught is a point where f of x naught happens to be in the domain of g. Otherwise, this statement makes no sense, obviously, right? But assuming x naught is the, such a point uh, and f is continuous at x naught and then g is continuous at f of x naught, then, uh, sorry, not f compose g, bad habit, very bad habit. g compose f is the correct order here, is continuous at um, x naught, okay? So remember, the domain of G compose F, according to this, is this set. So we, we to show that this is true, what we want to do is let Xn be a sequence in the set of um, X in the domain of F such that, oops, such that f of x is in the domain of g, okay? Uh, and then this sequence we require to converge to x naught. What we wanna show obviously is that g compose f of xn converges to g of f of x naught. So, um, Okay, uh, but to show this, uh, what we can say is, so because um, x, sorry, because f is continuous at x naught, we know f of xn converges to f of x naught. But then because at, uh, g is continuous at f of x naught, g of f of xn converges to g of f of x naught. So g compose f is continuous at, right, because this equals g compose f of xn. And of course this equals g compose f of x naught, which is what we want. Right, so at uh, x naught, okay? So that's uh, pretty simple. Um, it's, there's almost nothing there really. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's an important theorem. It's actually very powerful. This is in some ways like more powerful than the theorems that let us like add and, uh, you know, add and multiply and divide functions um, because you can, get a lot of continuous functions this way just by composing functions. And in fact, if anything, really, 
if you, you can define a concept of continuity for functions of two variables. And using that definition, you can show that the function of two variables, which just multiplies the two inputs, is continuous. And the function of uh, two variables, which just adds the two inputs, is also continuous. Or the one that divides the two inputs is continuous, right? And then just using the composition of continuous functions, you can show that like adding or, or multiplying or dividing any two continuous functions gives you a continuous function. Um, so really, they're all kind of special cases of um, of this uh, theorem, although sometimes for like higher numbers of variables. Okay, so the last little thing I want to do here is just kind of show you some examples of how we can use these theorems to uh, get a lot of um, information, like get, be able to say a lot of functions are continuous. So like suppose, um, you know, constant functions f of x equals x, f of x equals sine of x, or yeah, let me just kind of list these off, sine of x, cosine of x, or e to the x uh, are continuous, right? Then, um, for example, 17.4, uh, so, all right, let's actually call this like uh, F1, F2, F3, and F4 or something. Okay, um, so constants and F1 of X, right, which is just X. Uh, and then if you use the theorem, theorems 17.4 parts one and two, Uh, tell us that all polynomials are continuous, right? Because a polynomial you just take by, I mean, you just get by taking X itself and then multiplying it by itself, right? So like, you know, I don't know, um, something like uh, X cubed minus three X squared plus 40, right? This is, um, you know, F1 of X times F1 of X times F1 of X minus um, a constant times, or plus actually negative three, plus a constant times, you know, F1 of X times F1 of X, um, you know, plus another constant Right, so we just have constants and F1 of X, and then we're allowed to multiply them and add them together, right? And so we can get any polynomial we want that way. Uh, and then the theorem 17.4 parts one and two tells us that at every step of the process, we still have a continuous function basically, right? So you can sort of build up whatever polynomial you want. Polynomial you want. Uh, if you really wanted to, you could sort of set this down as like a um, very formal inductive argument, but uh, I'm not gonna go through that right now. Hopefully you guys are kind of getting to the point where like when I say something like this, you know, you, you can kind of just mentally visualize like how that argument would go without having to, you know, set it all down uh, very carefully. But uh, yeah, anyway, so, so that's how you can get like all polynomials, for example, and then like, uh, you know, uh, then like, you know, so then all the theorems and functions we have give us anything like, you know, uh, sine of um, x squared plus e to the cosine cubed of um, x minus sine of x uh, plus seven um, you know, minus, I don't know, cosine of x, right, plus x squared minus 15 or something, right? This is all continuous because 
it's just built out of, so here we have a composition, right? So here we're adding three things together. Obviously this is continuous. This is continuous, right? This we're assuming is continuous. And then the thing inside you can get is continuous just by kind of breaking it down into more pieces. And then once you show that the thing inside here is continuous, then, uh, you know, the composition is continuous by, uh, you know, 17.5, which we just proved, right? So, um, so you can sort of just plug any function, you can put any function you want inside of another function, or you can multiply them or add them or whatever, and you'll end up with more continuous functions. Um, also, you'll get like, things like, uh, I mean, I think this is just continuous everywhere uh, because everything in it is continuous at every point. But also we can say like sine of one over X is continuous for X not equal to zero because one over X is continuous for X not equal to zero, right? That's by 17.4 uh, part three, right? Because we know constants are continuous and X is continuous. So one over X should be continuous wherever X is not zero uh, by 17.4 part three. And then plugging that into sine of X tells us that sine is continuous wherever X is not zero. Sine of one over X is continuous wherever X is not zero by 17.5. Uh, so anyway, um, that's just some examples of the functions you can get uh, using these theorems. Although you have to be careful about these uh, problematic points where uh, one of the functions may not be continuous or may not be defined or whatever, um, always be mindful of that. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so that's it for this video and that should be the end of this lecture. So I'll see you in the next one.